Muchas gracias. Buenos días. That's about does it for my Spanish. <laughs> thank you uh, for being here this morning, and Gian, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, uh, a pleasure to be here in Mexico City. Um, and I got to miss uh, some of the elections yesterday in California, which is also uh, probably nice to be here as well. Um, what I wanted to do this morning is to talk to you generally about California's approach to climate change, which is quite rigorous and extensive, and then uh, talk a little bit about how it all relates to cities. I think you'll see that the approach uh, very much applies to cities, even as I talk about it broadly, uh, but there are some very specific things that I want to talk about in relationship to cities as well. Um, but first, let me talk about California's Climate Change Action Program, uh, which I say is quite comprehensive and extensive. Um, the first thing to, uh, to know is that California has a law requiring that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% from 1990 levels um, by 2030. So that's a little, uh, about 12 years from now. Uh, this is, California is now the world's fifth largest economy, um, which is an interesting thing to think about. That means that only the United States, China, Japan, and Germany have larger economies than the state of California. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because if California can take this very uh, complex economy and uh, reduce emissions by 40% in 12 years, then it is our view that uh, much of the rest of the world can do so as well. So uh, we think it's important that California regardless of what uh, the federal government in the United States does, uh, stay on course to make these significant reductions. And so in order to do that, we have uh, laid out what we sometimes call seven pillars of uh, climate action. Um, these will sound fairly familiar to those of you who work in this area, but let me walk through them and talk a little bit about how we think about moving forward on these sets of issues. So uh, the first pillar, if you will, is uh, renewable energy. Um, we have a, re uh, this is also in the law, we have a requirement that uh, we get at least 50% uh, of our power for the, from the power sector, uh, at least 50% of it needs to be from renewable sources by the year 2030. That does not include nuclear, and it does not include large-scale hydro. The, the legislature made the decision that those would not count. They did want, not want to encourage more nuclear power or more large-scale hydro, so those don't count towards the 50% requirement. Um, right now, California has about 33% uh, of its power from renewable sources, primarily uh, geothermal, solar, and wind. The largest growing is solar, not surprisingly, uh, in California. Um, but wind and geothermal also uh, will grow as well. Um, so far, that is going extremely well. It's the place where we've made the most progress. Uh, there are challenges. It is uh, not easy to integrate um, renewables into the grid because uh, wind and solar in particular um, are periodic. The sun does not always shine and the wind does not always blow, so uh, it poses some challenges to how you run a, a sophisticated grid. Having said that, uh, we, we are confident that we'll 
be fine uh, with 50% renewables. And in fact, we expect that by 2030, we'll be close to 60%, closer to 60% than 50%, just because of our overall 40% reduction goal probably requires more than 50% renewables. So on that particular element, we're, we're confident and uh, I think we're doing very well. The second pillar uh, is that we need to double energy efficiency in buildings by 2030. Um, and this is a particular challenge. So uh, for example, um, if you think about the, the buildings here at, at the university, um, how would you double the energy efficiency of these buildings? It's uh, a pretty complicated problem. I'm looking up at, you could change your lighting, uh, you probably have to change your heat and uh, air conditioning sources. Um, you might think about having uh, renewable energy associated with these buildings. Um, and there may be quite an, another uh, set of possibilities. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit with respect to cities themselves in a minute, but in California, there are 14 million existing buildings. So those are the biggest challenge, uh, what to do with existing buildings. Um, new, new construction uh, in California has, uh, is subject to a very stringent code that requires energy efficiency in those buildings. And in fact, um, they have to be energy neutral by, uh, um, for re residential buildings uh, by 2025 and for commercial buildings by 2030. So new buildings are well on their way. And in fact, the Energy Commission uh, just a week or two ago uh, added a requirement that any new residential housing has to have uh, solar, uh, uh, it has to be combined with solar energy. So uh, that piece of it is going well. The retrofit of the buildings we think is a big challenge and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The third piece of this is uh, for California and, and having been in Mexico City just a couple of days and now, I, I think you face a similar challenge. The, the third pillar is transportation. So uh, in California, almost 50%, almost half of all emissions for greenhouse gases are connected to transportation, uh, either from vehicles or from the energy source for those vehicles or from refineries from uh, refining oil. So uh, Californians um, enjoy driving, uh, they enjoy cars, and changing that culture in the next 12 years, uh, our goal is to cut in half the usage of oil uh, by 2030 in the transportation sector. That will be a, a huge challenge. Right now we have about 400,000 electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles on the road. And uh, our goal by 2025 is to have well over a million and a half, and by 2030, uh, over five million. There are about 32 million vehicles in California. So uh, this is a, a very big challenge for us. We're spending a lot of time and money thinking about how to change the market. Um, obviously, this is a very big issue in cities, and I will talk a little bit about the challenges, not just of, of zero emission vehicles and, and transportation, uh, but also the, the coming, what we anticipate to be quite a transportation revolution with autonomous vehicles, which poses all kinds of new and different challenges. So, so those are the first three. Um, and uh, the, the fourth one that I, uh, I want to uh, call out uh, are short-lived climate pollutants. Um, these get less attention uh, sometimes than uh, we think they probably deserve. There are th the, there, the reason they're called short-lived is, uh, as you may know, carbon dioxide can last in the atmosphere for a hundred years or more. Um, so if we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it basically stays there for the rest of your lifetime and uh, impacts the carrying capacity of the atmosphere. 
with short-lived climate pollutants, they stay in the atmosphere for a shorter time. So, so uh, there are three primary short-lived climate pollutants. Um, methane, which is natural gas. Uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which uh, are uh, used as a uh, refrigerant in, uh, um, in air conditioners, uh, among other things. And uh, uh, soot or, or black carbon. Uh, which is primarily uh, the result of either um, burning um, fires and uh, cooking with uh, open flame uh, and also diesel particulates. So these last a much shorter time in the atmosphere. Methane has a half-life of about 12 years. Um, so if we stop emitting them, they will actually come out of the atmosphere relatively quickly and give us some additional time and uh, add to the capacity of the atmosphere to, to accept uh, the, the emissions that we're, we're providing from CO2. So in California, we think th this is a, a, a huge opportunity in part because all three of these, there are solutions that exist already. So um, California used to be the smog capital of the world. Um, Mexico City has on occasion had that title as well. So we have, a, a, all of us have a, a real interest uh, from a public health standpoint as well as from a climate change standpoint in seeing if we can uh, reduce um, black carbon. In California, we've reduced it about 95%. Um, and we have a, a requirement that we reduce it another 50% um, by 2030. There are very specific things that, that uh, can be done, um, and California has uh, done many of them, and in fact, Mexico has as well. Um, some of it is changing the mix of diesel fuel so that it uh, combusts in a, in, a, in a much better way and doesn't produce as much particulate. Um, we can also take action to reduce uh, various uh, sources of, of uh, fire uh, and open flame cooking. So there, there is a very specific set of, of actions that uh, are being taken and can be taken. And I think from a worldwide perspective, there should be a fair amount of optimism that we can uh, make progress with that. Methane comes primarily from three sources, um, from agriculture, uh, and within agriculture, primarily from uh, dairies. Um, cows uh, produce a heck of a lot of... Uh, uh, methane from both ends of the cow. Um, and uh, um, oil and gas production, uh, obviously big both in California and in Mexico. And uh, third is landfills. We know, and, but the thing about methane is that it's natural gas, it's a product. If you capture it, you can use it. And so there are technologies for each of these sectors uh, that can be used and uh, we're right now in the process uh, of um, miniaturizing an, uh, an instrument that was developed uh, at uh, uh, NASA and JPL in California that uh, will allow us to detect methane, large methane emission sources um, from space, from a satellite. Uh, and if we're, we're able to get that satellite uh, in orbit, we think that every jurisdiction uh, on the planet will be able to identify its primary sources of methane and, and um, take some action directly on that. So we're optimistic about making progress there. Hydrofluorocarbons, there actually is an international agreement. Uh, we'll see, uh, it, hopefully that will um, really address the problem. If we fail to address it, hydrofluorocarbons, because of the growth in air conditioning in places like India and China and Mexico, a lot of Latin America we, that we anticipate over the next 20 or 30 years, that actually can overwhelm the climate system. So we have to be uh, quite vigilant about hydrofluorocarbons. And it also underscores how important cities are because the primary places that we'll see um, much greater uh, air conditioning uh, will be in cities. So uh, 
optimism there. The next, the next uh, area that the California approach is addressing uh, is working in natural lands. You might not immediately think of them as uh, incredibly important in the uh, issue around climate change, but uh, in fact, um, th in California and there's some, some of this in Mexico as well, uh, they also can overwhelm the climate system. California has been hit by massive uh, wildfires. And so if we are unable to contain those wildfires and, and limit them, um, they become a very large source of uh, CO2 and black, <coughs> excuse me, black carbon emissions that have a very big impact on the climate system. Um, in addition to that, right now, um, you would hope that working uh, in natural lands, and by working lands I mean agricultural lands primarily, uh, you would hope that those lands would absorb carbon. Um, soil can absorb carbon, plants can absorb carbon. Unfortunately, right now in California, the working in natural lands are a source of emissions, primarily but not exclusively because of fires. Um, it's also the case that as you develop uh, natural and working lands, in other words, you put buildings and, and cities on them, uh, their emission profile soars. So there's one study that shows that if uh, compare a farm compared to uh, a city, um, the city has about 50 times the amount of emissions as the farm. So it's quite important to keep the as much as possible working in natural lands in, in that condition. Um, and there's also quite a lot of things that you can do to increase the uh, uh, ability of soil to absorb carbon. In fact, there's a really interesting um, effort uh, at the Sierra Gorda far Forest north of here in Carretero. Uh, if you're interested in this, they're doing some of the leading work on um, climate smart agriculture anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, we're doing a fair amount in California as well. Um, the sixth area, uh, we heard a, a fair amount of, about yesterday, uh, we uh, sometimes called adaptation. Um, we prefer in California to, to use the term resilience, although we use both terms. Um, we think it's part and parcel of everything that we have to do on climate. The, the impacts of climate are inevitable, um, but it's also smart um, and it, it allows us to um, to build cities in, in smarter ways and in better ways uh, that are resilient and uh, we think that it's, it's essential and I'll talk a little bit about that with respect to cities in a minute. Um, and then the final area uh, I think is just starting to get more and more attention. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's probably uh, essential to our ability to deal with climate change um, I'll just use the term carbon capture, sometimes called direct carbon cap capture or capture of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, the, the issue here is that the Paris Agreement and, and uh, scientific research says that the, the best approach is to not go beyond uh, two degrees and to be much closer to, to a degree and a half of warming overall. We really can't do that unless we actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. And there are different ways to do that. It's not just a machine that directly captures, captures carbon. Um, although those exist, um, and there are some actually operating in the world now, um, interestingly enough, if you capture uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, you can turn it into product, including fuel. There's a a company that uh, is doing exactly that, um, creating diesel fuel out of uh, CO2 capture. Um, but there are many other approaches, in, including some that I just mentioned. Uh, you can capture carbon in soil. Uh, you can capture it in, in the ocean. That's uh, a lot of where the carbon is going. Um, there are techniques, uh, for example, to capture carbon in aggregate uh, for that that uh, is put then into cement and concrete. Um, and so there are other 
approaches here um, that are just beginning to be explored. Um, and California would like to be among uh, the leaders in that, and I think there are opportunities all over the world. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're gonna be in this, that situation, but uh, we should recognize it and, and keep it as part of how we're thinking about our response to climate change. So, um, all of these, I didn't, I didn't talk so much about cities because that's California's overall approach, I think it's fairly clear that all of these things have relevance to cities, but I want to highlight a few of them. We had this slide up um, while I've been talking broadly, uh, and, and it was mentioned yesterday as well that about 75% of emissions are from urban environment, and that's not that surprising. So let's see here. Oops. Okay, so I want to talk uh, about these four topics, building, and I'll go fairly quickly here because I've talked about them uh, already to a certain extent. Um, buildings, transportation, land use, and resilience. So uh, this is uh, an interesting set of problems. There are 223 billion square meters of uh, floor space today in the world, and by 2060, that will double. Um, much of that will be built in the developing world. Uh, India and China will lead that, but Mexico uh, will have a significant amount as well, and, and California as well. So we absolutely have to figure out with new building, starting now because buildings last 50 years or more, how do we get to, to uh, zero emission buildings? Um, so that's, I mentioned uh, uh, some of our building codes in California requiring zero emission buildings. Um, we, for, for existing buildings, we're requiring um, that the existing buildings that we benchmark their energy use, and that, which means that we identify how much each building uses by way of energy and then we ratchet down uh, what they're going to be allowed to do so that they have to actually retrofit those buildings. So the, the reason I put this slide up is because it is a hugely urban problem um, and it is a, an overwhelming problem. If we double our building uh, capacity in the next, what is it, 30 years, uh, 32 years, we will overwhelm the climate system if, if we're using the same amount of energy that we're using for the buildings now. Oops. So, um, back to transportation for a minute. Uh, as I noted, 50% of emissions in California are from transportation. It's probably a little less worldwide, but not much. Uh, Californians drive 335 billion miles a year, 500 billion kilometers. Um, the sun is about 93 million miles away, so we can drive quite a few times to the sun and back, a few thousand. So uh, now, think about what happens with autonomous vehicles. There are different potential futures here. We can see a situation where uh, autonomous vehicles um, take people to and from transportation options like trains and buses, uh, subways, uh, or we could see a situation where many people have their own autonomous vehicles and their kids have autonomous vehicles if they're well-to-do, uh, and delivery systems are uh, empty except for groceries that are being delivered to your door, um, and gridlock gets not better but worse. And that has a lot of implications for how we build our cities and how we uh, deal with land use. So in California, we've been enamored of automobiles and the result has been that we've developed in a, in a sprawl, suburban way that really now is dependent on the automobile. So you can imagine with autonomous vehicles that could get worse, that people might sit in their cars and work while they're taking uh, very long distances. 
So we have to work hard, not just in California, but everywhere in the world, to make this a, a better future where you can get somewhere in Mexico City in far less time than you take right now. But the only way to do that is to make sure that autonomous vehicles are part of an overall transportation system. This is going to be a huge challenge for all of us, but we need to start thinking about it now because the expectation is within about five years we will start to see very serious um, expansion of autonomous vehicles. Uh, I'm sure it will start in California, but it will go everywhere else in the world. I keep doing that. Um, okay. All right, so now let me talk a little bit about um, California's con uh, climate connections to cities in particular. So every city in California, there are about 430 cities in California, has to do a general plan. It's sort of the constitution of the city. Uh, it lays out all the things that the city will do over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, and the public has a big part in that process. So my little office, the Office of Planning and Research in the Governor's Office, is responsible for creating the guidelines that the cities need to follow or should follow when they build these uh, plans. And so what we've done over the last number of years in the Brown administration is to rewrite the guidelines for these cities so now these cities have to pay attention. Much of what they're evaluating is the relationship of their general plan, how the city grows, what the city looks like, how it takes care of its population, and what its land use looks like. It has to relate very directly to climate change. So we've, we are building a set of tools that are available. They're in English, but um, you obviously uh, will have no problem with that. Um, but there's a set of tools that are available um, for cities, and they're publicly available. We have um, the ability to uh, map through uh, GIS, um, and cities can build out different scenarios. In fact, um, we made, we're making available to every city in California something called Urban Footprint, which is a scenario planning tool for those of you who um, are urban planners that allows a city to identify different possible futures. And then this program will tell you what the implications are, <coughs> not just for things like building density and roads, but for uh, tax revenue and for the impact on health and the impact on uh, conservation. And so this, uh, we, we hope to make this uh, available pretty much worldwide over the next uh, number of years. Um, and I think it will have implications far outside of California. Um, this is the, the basic climate policy that applies in California. So uh, reducing emissions, obviously. Uh, preparing for impacts, which is adaptation and resilience, and um, most relevant here uh, for you all, research. Um, we, uh, and, and Guido will talk about uh, the research efforts in California in more detail in a minute, but we think these are all connected and they're part of a continuum. Um, the slide is too detailed, but uh, what I, the point I want to make with it is uh, one of the requirements of of every city's general plan is that it have a safety element. It has to describe how the hazards that uh, exist for the community. Um, and now one of the hazards that they must address and deal with uh, is climate change and how the city over the next 20 or 30 years as they look forward uh, will adapt. And so adaptation now is built into the, the climate plans and the general plans of every city in California. Um, and if you're interested in this set of uh, data and, and uh, requirements, uh, take a look at caladapt.org. Um, and there are things on it like uh, the California Adaptation Planning Guide. Um, some of it is California specific, but we also think that it has applications outside as well. 
And oops. Um, and he, here's something that we uh, have built this year. Um, it's the Adaptation Clearinghouse. Uh, you can see the site for it, um, www.resilientca.org. Um, we uh, now compile in Clearinghouse all documents that we think are relevant to uh, resilience and, and adaptation <coughs> for cities and regions in California, but California has a broad set of impacts across rising seas and fires and et cetera, uh, and has wide implication. A um, couple of things quickly, and I'll wrap up here, but uh, California has an environmental law that requires for any project that, uh, that the, the, peep, the proponent of that project needs to evaluate what the uh, environmental impacts of the project are, and that includes climate change. So any large project in California has to look at the, the impacts of that project in relationship to climate change, um, and they have to write a document that addresses that um, set of issues. Um, and this is a, just a little bit more about that. Okay. Uh, every general plan um, has to look very extensively at climate change. What are the implications for the city, uh, for the region, both uh, in terms of the emissions that will come from the, the, the way the city is going to grow uh, and how the city will adapt. All right, I'm going to lead. Guido's going to talk about California's fourth climate assessment in a minute, which is our research program. So I'll leave that to Guido. And then I want to leave you with just one more thing here, uh, which is the Global Climate Action Summit in, Sac in uh, San Francisco coming up this September. Um, this is uh, a, a worldwide summit. Uh, we expect on the order of about 10,000 people. Um, and it includes uh, on our co-sponsor and steering committee will be uh, C40, which is an uh, uh, organization of cities, um, and also uh, the Under Two Coalition, which is an organization of states. It will focus quite a lot on what subnational governments can and are doing, as well as businesses, and it uh, will focus on all of the issues that uh, I just talked about in terms of having a healthy economy as we make a very quick conversion over the next 12 years to a significantly lower set of greenhouse gas emissions. So I hope you will, uh, I hope some of you will come and I hope you will follow it. It'll be on the, the World Wide Web. A lot of the uh, uh, sessions will be live um, and uh, we hope to have a quite extensive worldwide engagement. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat>